invades Virginia for the second time the first week of May. The result is the Battle of Chancellorsville. In two days, the Union Army loses over 23,000 men. The Army of the Potomac limps back to Washington, whipped once again. The Battle of Chancellorsville costs the South General Stonewall Jackson, accidentally shot and killed by his own men. In June, Lee makes a decision to invade uh, the United States or the, the Union again, and he makes his way all the way into central Pennsylvania. On June 27th, the uh, commander of the Army of the Potomac, Joseph Hooker, is replaced by General George Meade. Meade has that job for three days. He meets Robert E. Lee at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. For three days, 170,000 combatants slug it out, 60,000 casualties, the largest battle of the Civil War. The Army of the Potomac emerges victorious. The biggest argument about the Battle of Gettysburg is how they let Lee's army, 20 miles long when it was marching down a road, get all the way from central Pennsylvania back to Virginia without being stopped. On the 4th of July, Vicksburg, Mississippi falls to Grant and Sherman, who have been laying siege to that city for the last six weeks. Gives the Union two huge back-to-back -back victories, and a lot of people think that could possibly be the end of the war. But by July 1863, the Confederacy was running out of everything. It really didn't have an economy to start a war, it was running out of supplies. One of its biggest problems was food. So the state of Georgia began shipping large bags of peanuts to the Confederate Army. But down south, peanuts are not called peanuts, they are called Goober, Goober peas. That's right. Two guys ate their lunch one day in July of 1863 and wrote a song called Goober Peas. Now, this became one of the most popular Confederate songs of the American Civil War but I indeed have a past with this song. Back in the mid 60s, when everybody my age rushed out to buy Beatle records or Rolling Stone records or something like that, I went out and bought a Burl Ives record. It's not funny. I love that record. But that record had Goober Peas on it, and I hated that song. So when it came to Goober Peas, I picked the arm of my record player up, moved it over to the next song, so I wouldn't have to hear Peas, 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 eating Goober Peas. Just couldn't stand it. I got into the Civil War music business and everywhere I went, somebody'd say, play Goober Peas, and I'd think, well, why would you want to hear that thing? But anyway, I found out very, very popular, and most people really enjoy the song. So I learned it, so I learned it. Now, Lisa and I have done the State House Encampment several times downtown. I believe they're having that the last week of April again this year. But uh, one year they brought in 2,000 elementary school kids, and the guy at the bus said, go find the old guy with the guitar, he'll teach you Goober Peas. We did this song almost 62 times in a row. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, I refuse to sing this thing by myself. I'd like to welcome you to the sing-along portion of tonight's program. I'm gonna teach all you fortunate people, don't let any of them leave, Dennis. I'm gonna teach all of you fortunate people the chorus to Goober Peas. Lisa and I will do the heavy lifting on the verses, but you can join us on the chorus. We will all lift our voices and do an absolute Confederate classic from the American Civil War. So are you all ready to sing? Are you? Okay. I want to see a lot of participation, and I want to warn you that eight-year-olds get the chorus a second time around. So I will do it two times for your benefit. It goes like this. It goes, peas, 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 eating goober peas. Goodness, how delicious, eating goober peas. They look stunned. Peas, 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 eating goober peas. Goodness, how delicious, eating goober peas. Here we go. Sitting by the roadside on a summer day, chatting with my best mates, passing time away. Lying in the shadows underneath the trees. Goodness, how delicious, eating goober peas. Peas, 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 eating goober peas. Goodness, how delicious, eating goober peas. Just before the battle, the general hears a row. He says the Yanks are coming. I hear the rifles now. He turns around and wonder, and what do you think he sees? The Georgia militia eating goober peas. Peas, 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 eating goober peas. Goodness, how delicious, eating goober peas. This is his favorite verse. <laughs> I think the song has lasted almost long enough. It's kind of silly and the words are mighty rough. I wish this war was over, free from rags and fleas. We kiss our wives and sweethearts and gobble goober peas. Peas, 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 eating goober peas. Goodness, how delicious, eating goober peas. Peas, 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 eating goober peas. Goodness, how delicious, eating goober peas.
all the hours I've worked on all these other wonderful songs. Guru Peace is number one on the hit list. In July of 1863, after the Battle of Gettysburg, a lot of people north and south thought with these two huge Union victories, the end of the Civil War may be very, very near. People began watching the newspapers, hoping possibly that the Union and the Confederacy would make a peaceful settlement. One of those people was 19-year-old Annie Gilmore of Boston, Massachusetts. Annie was an Irish immigrant who had come to the United States with her family in 1851. Her older brother was a gentleman by the name of Patrick Gilmore. Back in Ireland, Patrick was known as a very well-known brass band arranger, composer, and player himself. Very, very gifted musician. When they arrived in Massachusetts, Boston, Massachusetts in 1851, it didn't take Patrick very long to establish himself in that very same vein. Civil War began, he was asked by the state of Massachusetts to be the bandmaster for all the regimental bands from the state of Massachusetts. After the war, he would have Gilmore's brass band that would tour the world, it would become world famous. He was eclipsed by a kid born in 1854 by the name of John Philip Sousa, and that's why you have never heard of Patrick Gilmore. However, Annie at that time was engaged to Captain John O'Rourke of the Union Army, and she went to her older brother Patrick and said, write a song for John when he comes home from the war. The war is gonna be over any day. Uh, Patrick Gilmore took an old Irish ballad called Johnny We Hardly Knew You, stole the melody, and composed a song that became known as When Johnny Comes Marching Home Again. It was published September 23rd, 1863, very quickly became popular with the Confederate Army. They were called Johnny Rebs, we were called Billy Yanks. So the song became very popular with both armies by the end of the Civil War, it remains one of the biggest hits of the Civil War. John and Annie, however, did not get married for another 12 years. They got married in 1875. I have no idea what was going on there. The guy had cold feet. But anyway, they got married. They settled in Plattsburgh, Nebraska, where John uh, served in local politics. He was the postmaster there. They lived out their lives there. The house they owned is on the National Register of Historic Places as the home of the couple that inspired this famous Civil War song. Johnny comes marching home again for all. Give him a hearty welcome then, hurrah, hurrah. The men will cheer, the boys will shout, the ladies they will all turn out. We'll all feel gay when Johnny comes marching home. The old church bell will peal with joy, hurrah, hurrah. To welcome home our darling boy, hurrah, hurrah. The village lads and lassies say with roses they will strew the way. We'll all feel gay. On that day, hurrah, hurrah, the choicest treasures then display, hurrah, hurrah, and let each one perform some part to fill with joy the warrior's heart. We'll all feel gay when Johnny comes marching home. Johnny comes marching home again, hurrah, hurrah, we'll give him a hearty welcome then, hurrah, hurrah, the men will cheer, the boys will shout, the ladies. not end in 1863. In September of 1863, we had what became known as the Battle of Chickamauga, fought in northern Georgia under the, uh, the two armies were under the command of Major General William Stark Rosecrans from Sunbury, Ohio, and of course the Confederate Army was under the command of Braxton Bragg. Uh, Rosecrans had been ordered to go into Georgia and engage the Confederate Army there. Now, he didn't know that the Confederate Army had been reinforced with another huge corps under the command of James Longstreet. The Battle of Chickamauga was a huge Union route that lasted two days. The Union Army was pushed all the way back to Chattanooga, Tennessee, and the Confederate siege of Chattanooga began in October of 1863. Grant arrived from Memphis. Grant and Sherman arrived from Memphis with 20,000 soldiers. They fired Rosecrans, relieved him of command, replaced him with George Thomas. A lot of people feel that was very, very unfairly done. They established a supply line that would become known as the Cracker Line. 
They reestablished supplies to Chattanooga, broke the siege. They fought the Battle of Lookout Mountain on November 24th, the Battle of Missionary Ridge on November 25th, and pushed the Confederate Army back into the state of Georgia and out of Tennessee for the rest of the war. As the spring of 1864 breaks, Grant is uh, promoted to Lieutenant General, first person to hold that grant, uh, that rank since George Washington held it after the American Revolution. Grant decides he will take the Army of the Potomac and invade Virginia for the third time. Sherman will take the Army of the Cumberland, he will invade the state of Georgia, and he will attempt to capture Atlanta. As spring breaks, Grant goes into Virginia, he fights the Battle of the Wilderness, the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse, the Battle of Cold Harbor, and in five weeks, Grant loses over 40,000 men. People think this is just amazing, we could lose those kind of people, but Grant doesn't do what everybody else did. He doesn't turn around and go back to Washington. He pushes deeper and deeper into the state of Virginia. In July of 1864, the Union siege of Petersburg will begin. Now by this time, the American Civil War, believe it or not, had cost this country 600,000 lives. It has another 150,000 to go before it ends the following April. For many, many years, the number was 620,000. Historians in the last 15 years have discovered they never counted casualties from field hospitals. So that number has gone up by 170,000 men, or over that 180,000 men. So uh, uh, huge difference in the numbers, and it's hard to believe we could have that kind of mass killing going on right here on our own soil. But songs at that time quit being patriotic, they quit being silly like we were peas, and they quit being mushy like Lorraine. They became sad, sad like, songs like A Faded Coat of Blue, Who Will Care for Mother Now, Weeping Sad and Lonely, all of them dealt with the loss so many families had felt during this war. Another song was written by Walter Kittredge, who was a young musician out of uh, New Hampshire. He wrote a song called Tenting Tonight on the Old Campground. When he took it to have it published, the publisher said, I don't need any more sad war songs. Just take that and go away. We well, gave it to a vocal group called the Hutchinson Singers. They did it in concert for the Union Army. The Union soldiers loved it. They wrote Oliver Ditson a letter and said, publish this song. And with that, Walter Kittredge became a one-hit wonder. This became one of the most popular songs by the end of the war. After the war, it was the number one song at all the huge reunions held at the large battlefields. The last one was in 1938 at Gettysburg. 75th anniversary of that battle, it was attended by over 1,200 veterans that were there in 1863. Tending Tonight on the Old Campground, very popular song, both during the war and afterwards. We're tenting tonight on the old campground. Give us a song to cheer. Our weary hearts, a song of hope and friends we love so dear. Many are the hearts that are weary tonight, wishing for the war to cease. Many are the hearts looking for to see the dawn of peace. Tenting tonight, tenting tonight, tenting on the old campground. We're tenting tonight on the old campground, thinking of days gone by. The loved ones at home who gave us a hand, the tear that said,
<laughs> of course, Grant and Lee will stay in siege at Petersburg until the following spring. Sherman, however, makes excellent progress, progress moving through the state of Georgia. On September 2nd, 1864, he captures Atlanta, and this pretty well cements the death knell for the Confederacy. Atlanta was the last large supply base for the Confederacy, and it is very securely now in Union hands. Sherman, of course, comes up with the idea for the march to the sea. That starts on November 16, 1864, moves across the state of Georgia, 300 miles on a path 60 miles wide. The Union Army pretty well destroys everything in its path. They arrive in Savannah, Georgia on December 22, 1864. And Sherman sends Lincoln a telegram saying, for Christmas, I give you the city of Savannah. Everybody expects Sherman to stay there. He doesn't do that. He continues moving. He moves up through South Carolina and into North Carolina. Now, as Sherman's army is moving across the South, it begins to liberate small prisoner of war camps. Grant and Lincoln decided in the end of 1864 they would stop prisoner exchanges. Up until that time in the war, about every 90 days, both sides actually exchange prisoners. So if you're a held prisoner, you may only be a prisoner for six months, maybe just a few weeks, sometimes a year and a half. But eventually you would get exchanged. They stopped the exchanges, and as a result, the prison camps north and south filled up very, very quickly. And they were all horrible places. We all hear about Andersonville. The Union had one just as bad in Camp Douglas in uh, Chicago, Illinois. Camp Chase on the west side of Columbus. There are over 2,200 Confederates buried there as a result of the way they were treated and the fact that they got sick and died while in captivity. So these places were horrible. But as they moved across the South, they began liberating these small Union uh, or Confederate prisoner of war camps. George Root was inspired by that. He wrote a song he had originally entitled Prisoner's Hope. And this was to give those people that were locked up down south the hope that the Union Army would soon liberate them. He called it Prisoner's Hope and became better known as Tramp, 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 written in late summer of 1864, very, very popular tune by the end of the war. And it goes like this. In my prison cell I sit, thinking, Mother dear of you, and our bright and happy home so far away. And the tears they fill my eyes, spite of all that I can do. Though I try to cheer my comrades and be gay. Tramp, 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 the boys are marching. Cheer up, comrades, they will come. And beneath the starry flag, we shall breathe the air again. Of the free land in our own beloved home.
Folks, you've been a wonderful audience, and we want to thank all of you for coming out to listen to us tonight. We've got one more song, one more story to share with you before we go home. However, we do take questions and requests afterward, so anybody that wants to stick around and hear another couple hours of music, you're more than welcome to do so. We also have CDs for sale, $10 each, with uh, most of the songs, or all of the songs, I think, that we've done tonight. And uh, if you see Lisa, she can fix you up with one of those. At my age, I am not permitted to handle cash anymore. So, But uh, we want to thank you all. We've got yes, one more story and one more tune. We do hope you've enjoyed the program. This next song would be one of the most popular songs of the Civil War by far. This song started out as a Methodist hymn written in 1800. It was originally entitled, Brothers Will You Meet Us on Canaan's Happy Shores. It was Methodist, but by the middle of the 19th century, the United States went through what was called the Second Awakening. And religion became a very, very important staple in the American way of life. You would go to church on Sunday and then you could argue with your neighbors whether they should be a Presbyterian, Protestant, a Baptist, a Catholic, or whatever. But religion was absolutely a backbone in American life in the mid-19th century. All denominations used Brother, will you, Brothers Will You Meet Us as what they called a camp meeting song or a revival song. And of course, it was a camp meeting song because the minister sang a line to the congregation, the congregation sang it back to him. Very easy song to learn. It had one line in each, each verse. So if you just learned one line in each verse, that was very simple. And then it had a real catchy, glory, glory, hallelujah chorus. In 1861, when the Civil War began, in the 13th Volunteer Massachusetts Infantry, there was a young private by the name of John Brown. John had the distinction of being the worst soldier in the entire regiment. He couldn't remember the order of arms, he couldn't march and step, he couldn't carry his rifle properly, he did everything wrong. So the men picked on him, they took Brothers Will You Meet Us and invented what they called the John Brown Song. They found out it was great to march and drill to. John would even sing along with them about the mistakes he was making trying to become a soldier in the Union Army. The summer of 1861, the 13th Massachusetts wound up in uh, Washington, D.C. as part of the Army of the Potomac. Everywhere they marched, they sang John Brown this and John Brown that. And everybody that heard them thought they were singing about John Brown the abolitionist, who of course had unsuccessfully raided the Federal Armory at Harpers Ferry, Virginia on October 16, 1859, was executed six weeks later on December 2, 1859, much shorter appeal process in those days, but he was actually convicted of treason by the state of Virginia, and he became a martyr for the cause of slavery. Everybody thought the song was about that guy. So they added their own verses about that John Brown, plus the John Brown that the song was written about, and they simply called the song Glory Hallelujah. Patrick Gilmore, who wrote When Johnny Comes Marching Home Again, would write the arrangement. It would be printed in sheet music form in the fall of 1861. It was actually better known to the Union Army as John Brown's Body. By far became the most popular marching song of the American Civil War. Enter Julia Ward Howe, born in 1819 in New York City into a very wealthy family. She re ex received a very exclusive private education. By the time she was 18, she could speak four languages. She was a published author. She would marry a doctor 20 years her senior by the name of Samuel Gridley Howe. They got married in 1843. They had six children together, but Julia was a very, very active woman. She was an ordained minister. She became very active in the women's movement going across the country. She was an abolitionist. She was active in civil rights. Her husband thought she should stay home, be quiet, and take care of the kids. This caused some tension. The war began. Dr. Howe became the founder of the American Sanitation or the U.S. Sanitation Commission. The Sanitation Commission would inspect camps and make sure soldiers were practicing good hygiene. They were doing a camp inspection on November 16, 1861. Julia came down from New York City to join her husband and a group of other people doing this camp inspection. A company of men marched by them singing, John Brown's body lies moldering in the grave. And a friend of Julia's leaned over and said, that song is really disgusting. You can do a much better job with it. The next morning in 20 minutes, she wrote a poem she called The Battle Hymn of the Republic. She sold it to Atlantic Monthly newspaper in February of 1862 for a whopping five dollars. Patrick Gilmore wrote the arrangement for it as well. It came out in sheet music form in May of 1862 and it spread like wildfire through the Union States. One of the most popular songs that ever came out of the American Civil War. It is still not real popular down south with certain groups of people, but very, very popular tune. Julia Ford Howe went on and founded her own newspaper 
She represented her husband in the meetings of the Secret Six. Her husband, husband was one of the men that actually financed the John Brown raid in October of 1859. She would uh, take his place in those meetings after he passed away. She was the first person to pitch the idea of Mother's Day to Congress in 1888. They turned it down. They thought that was a silly idea. Somebody else revived that right after the turn of the century and then it was a really good idea. She founded the League of Women's Clubs in 1893. So ladies, if you belong to a women's club, you can thank Julia Ward Howe. Theodore Roosevelt tried to make the Battle Hymn of the Republic our national anthem in 1902. There are still enough uh, Confederates serving in Congress, they didn't let that happen. Otherwise, we'd sing the Battle Hymn before the, battle hymn before the NASCAR races on Sunday afternoon. So, we know you can sing very well after hearing you join us on Goober Peas. We'll ask you to join us on the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Uh, if you don't know the verses, just do the chorus with us. If you don't know the chorus, make up some words. I've been doing that for about an hour now. We'll go. Again, we want to thank you all very, very thank much for very joining much. us. You ready, bass player? I'm ready. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes and crowns are stored. At whose fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword, his truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah.